So yes, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come to Reporting Revolution, How to Tool Citizen Media as a Force for Liberation. Um, I'm Adrian. I'm joined by Felipe and Dartana. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about how to use social media and how other social movements have used social media in the past uh, to facilitate the movement, um, as well as some hot tips on how to best use social media in order to spread the word about your social movement. Next slide. So we're gonna start with a little overview of how social movements and social media have overlapped, have engaged with each other. There's a lot of social movements who have used social media and gotten a lot of attention recently. We've got the umbrella movement coming out of Hong Kong. We have Black Lives Matter, mostly out of the United States, Occupy Wall Street internationally, as well as the so-called Arab Spring. All of these use social media in different ways in order to spread the message internationally about their movement as well as gain support and organize amongst themselves. Some of the most important ways that social media was used in these movements, democratize decisions, especially in something that seems like a grassroots movement, since there's no localized leader that can come out in the front, uh, it's more distributed. Democratized decisions is really important. So using social media to get a general consensus has been key in these movements. Self-representation is also really important, and I'll talk a little bit about that after this. Self-representation self allows social movements to give the messages that they want to give. They actually are able to present themselves as they would wish to. And then finally, identity building is really key. One of the ways that we can see if a social movement is going to last and is going to continue being successful is if they've built a strong identity around their cause, and social media can be used to do that. One way that this is achieved is something called emancipatory journalism. Emancipatory journalism is when social movements go against the mainstream media and reports the movement from their subjective view. This is really, really important, particularly in protest type movements because mainstream media often reports social movements as aggressive or dangerous, especially when the mainstream media is in bed with the state. Um, so there's a lot of examples of that where the mainstream media will present social movements as aggressive so that way the general populace doesn't have as much sympathy for them or can actually justify police violence against social movements. Emancipatory journalism also humanizes the movement. It gives a human face to the movement and represents members of the movement in a way that creates um, sympathy and empathy for the movement and therefore support. It also allows a wider reach of digital platforms to get an international audience. And this has been really key in a lot of different social movements, particularly as we'll talk about the farmers protests in India, where international support means international funds, international coverage, and that can also help a social movement continue long-term. I'll hand it over to Darsana to get some background on Indian journalism. All right. <clears throat> So um, I'm what my presentation will do is kind of um, give a background on Indian journalism, drawing on um, giving a few examples or um, or so um, uh, around some of the things that Adrian just talked about and uh, setting up for Pyridi's presentation um, so that you can appreciate why uh, citizen or emancipatory media use among the farmers like, as part of the farmers protest was so important for the movement. Um, so, yeah, um, historically, Indian journalism witnesses a concentration of ownership with a handful of corporations with close ties to political parties owning most media houses. Most Indians know which political party a TV news channel uh, or a newspaper favors based on who owns the outlet and their political stance. If you watch a few minutes of a TV news coverage or read a few news articles, you will know um, which side they're tending to. So the influence exerted by owners and the political parties they favor has had a chilling effect. Journalists feel nudged to avoid criticizing political and corporate elites, especially those who directly or indirectly pay their salaries. Another peculiarity is the strong interference of the state in policing what counts as news. Researchers such as Silvio Weisbord, uh, Vahutu, Vincent Cabanas, and Jonathan Ong have noted similar tendencies in Latin American, Asian, and African democracies. In India, along with the state curtailing criticism and limiting access to official information, the state is also a major player in creating misinformation. 
Um, so Adrian had mentioned um, the use of um, mainstream media coverage to vilify uh, protesters and make protests seem like something that is violent and has to be policed. So this is also part of the kind of misinformation that um, that is produced and kind of coordinated by people that are part of the ruling party in India, which is uh, the BJP. Um, stories that uh, these stories usually serve the majoritarian politics of the ruling party, which preaches an India for the Hindus ideal, which heavily relies on um, trying to pretend that we have a common united Hindu identity. Everything is fine here. India is great and we don't talk about problems. That's um, that's kind of um, a simplistic way of putting it. But that's uh, but this has very uh, dark uh, elements as well because you this um, idea of a common identity is often built by vilifying another set of people usually minority communities such as muslims or people who criticize the government such as the case of the farmers that we will be discussing later so any kind of criticism about the government is something that needs to be shut down um, and any dissenter who pokes holes in these majoritarian fake news narratives are censored, arrested, or harassed. Over the past few days, you might have read about the arrest of Mohammed Subair, uh, the co-founder of Alt News, a leading fact-checking alternative media outlet. Subair was arrested over a tongue-in-cheek tweet from over four years ago, even though everybody knows that the real reason is because he turned people's attention to the ruling party's openly Islamophobic remarks that inter invited international censure. Very often, we can also see the government exerting control through platforms such as Twitter and Facebook, forcing the takedown of posts or accounts critical of the government. To that point, you can see here the account of um, this tweet from Trolley Times mentioning that the accounts of some community media and citizen bloggers who were very vocal about the farmers' protests had been taken down by Twitter very recently. Given all of these factors that I've mentioned, it's unsurprising that there is a lack of diversity and inclusion in news coverage. As mentioned before, the state and compliant media espouse a majoritarian politics of India for the Hindus, eliding minority concerns and issues, and sometimes actively instigating anti-minority and mainly anti-Muslim sentiments and advocating animosity and violence. This status quo is actively consolidated by the state and elites by making access to information and advertisements conditional on compliance. That is, if your news organization criticizes the government or a major corporation, you will not receive advertisements from the government, political parties, and corporations. This is a big deal in the context of declining advertising revenues. Um, and it's, it's kind of like an arm-twisting tactic that is employed not just against new upstart critiques such as maybe uh, alt news which has come uh, come up in the few like in the past few years but also against prominent newspapers like the hindu that have been around seemingly forever which has progressively become less critical of the government ever since they were told to toe the line or lose ad revenue Another factor that dissuades coverage of marginalized issues and topics is the commercialization of media. This is something that can be noted in the case of most um, media landscapes across the world. News outlets face the pressure from investors and owners to become profitable, which translates to a chase for viewership numbers and ratings, and in turn to a shift in focus towards popular and entertaining content at the expense of detailed and critical coverage. This leads to a disproportionate focus on urban issues, entertainment, and sensational coverage of um, national level politics and not really regional issues. Issues faced by rural and marginal communities do not bring in the big bucks as they don't have mass appeal. This is also kind of the reason why the um, coverage of the farmers' protest was by the mainstream media was extremely spotty and tended to focus on uh, any kind of like clashes or violence and things like uh, things that can be milked and made into something that's um, similar to an outrageous event um, that can, you know, uh, easily bring in a lot of viewership and can be sensationalized. But uh, actually um, providing fair coverage of the farmers' demands or what their, um, what their movement is all about, what their demands are, that's not something that was done by in many mainstream channels. 
and the pro elite bias of the media becomes less surprising when we turn our attention to who writes or presents the news indian news outlets especially mainstream media is composed largely of upper class and caste males according to a report published by news laundry and oxfam less than 5% of indian english language newspaper articles are written by dalits and adivasis um these are marginalized communities and indigenous communities even online 72% of byline articles are written by upper caste journalists close to 90% of pre leadership positions in news media across formats is composed of upper caste with very little scheduled caste and scheduled tribe representation because of these factors there is an attendant disconnect from rural poor and marginalized communities concerns especially if they are counter to or critical of the ruling party this is the case with the farmers protest which took place just on the periphery of delhi which could very well be the hinderlands for the media because it's so far away from what they look at and what they tend to focus on um they criticized and uh, demanded a reform of the farm bills which is something that is an achievement of the ruling party that clearly would benefit giant indian multinational corporations like reliance so you can kind of see why reporting about the farmers movement would be something that um the indian uh, news media was actively discouraged from doing and it's something that's extremely risky for them um so this kind of explains why the mainstream media was so apathetic to the farmers movement um and focused on clashes and such rather than providing fair coverage of the farmers demands um because of the chilling effect that is produced by state and corporate interference heavily policing what news can be reported and how it is absolutely necessary for prog progressive social movements to find safe spaces to disseminate information among their solidarity groups as well as the wider public um and i know that uh, the background overview that i have provided so far is extremely depressing uh, kind of scary and not very optimistic um but at the same time i do see a source of hope in the indian uh, news landscape uh, which is alternative citizen and community media um and this is not to forget the crucial role that journalism has played historically in social movements in india alternative independent media were key to the organizing around the indian freedom struggle when we were fighting the british or we were trying to get rid of them as well as various caste reform movements popular science and literacy movements and so on marginalized communities like fisher folk who were considered untouchable used newspapers to express pride in their identity reclaim their social status and challenge hegemonic culture and their marginalization and stigmatization revolutionaries and reformists uh, who were part of uh, either the indian movement for independence or caste reform movements and other such uh, progressive social movements were also editors of magazines and weeklies essays and so on their writing played a crucial role in societal transformation moving people to reflect generating a political co consciousness and building a community or a common identity around a cause demanding change from those in power even today alternative media such as the wire alt news scroll news laundry caravan that operate nationally and vernacular language or regional ones such as dool news the queue the sikkim chronicle east mojo and so on play an important role in holding power accountable drawing attention to diverse concerns affecting local communities and advocating for social transformation and justice um while alternative and citizen media have a crucial role to play in india given the lack of political criticism and accountability lack lack of representation of diverse concerns pro elite bias and to advocate for social transformation and justice for marginalized communities however they tend to replicate some of the problematic mainstream trends such as focusing on um local or regional celebrity news while the mainstream tends to focus on national with some degree of sensationalism in order to get their content surfaced on facebook and other social media which are key distribution channels for these mostly digital only outlets which need to get their content across through social media channels the pressure to constantly deliver engaging trending and viral content with limited resources often nudges these alternative media away from pursuing diverse content and prioritizing the representation of marginal concerns alternative media also experience a crisis of legitimacy having to prove their metal as 
credible news organizations. For this reason, they try to emphasize their journalistic credentials, for instance, highlighting that legacy media background, uh, highlighting the legacy media background and expertise of senior journalists and showcasing strict adherence to journalistic uh, principles. Corollary to this is the drawing of rigid boundaries, not letting citizens fully participate in news making, limiting their participation to post-publication activities such as sharing, liking, commenting, um, or maybe barring the occasional guest post. This restricts the ability of progressive social movements to use alternative media as channels for their messaging or advocacy. They can't consistently provide coverage on their movement because they have limited power in setting the agenda on what is discussed by the alternative news channel. So because of these reasons, we need to move from alternative media that have a, a wider scope or a wider um, ambit to something like citizen media that is very closely part of and um, kind of like, uh, what is it called? Like something that is part of and grows within the movement. So citizen media gets people on the ground and at the grassroots level to voice their concerns and can be a crucial resource for organization and solidarity building while simultaneously building capacity. Citizen activists learn by doing. Um, uh, uh, an example, a couple of examples that come to mind are community media like CGNet Swara and Khabar Lahiriya. Uh, they promote social development by encouraging rural citizens and in the case of Khabar Lahiriya, rural women uh, reporters to play a more active role in news making. Citizen journalists obtain and report news and liaise with mainstream media to elicit coverage. This has had important implications as citizens can fact check authorities and the narratives they produce about rural communities. For example, correcting the official statistics on crop loss due to drought with ground reports on CG Netswara was instrumental in fa farmers getting adequate compensation. So we demonstrate the need for and the importance of citizen media in India and in the context of social movements today through the case of the farmers protest that started in September 2020, following the passing of three farm bills that would substantially undercut farmers' ability to get a fair price for their produce or, or rather not get as much as set a fair price for their produce, leaving them at the mercy of multinational corporations and their price setting mechanisms. Uh, now I will hand it over to Paridi so that she can take us through the case study. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Darshana and thank you Adrian. Uh, Adrian has introduced you all to social movements and uh, emancipatory journalism and Darshana has very well set up the context of India for you. Uh, she has showed us all how deeply connected the media is with the government and the corporates. We know that they are now within the context of India, very, very, we can almost call them merged at the current moment. Uh, and look, we have to understand the farmers movement before I give you, uh, before I expand on it, we have to understand as primarily, not just a resistance against the government policy, but also a resistance against the corporate, like a corporate intervention into media, a co corporate takeover, a corporate heavy handedness into uh, uh, farmers, uh, into uh, farming and agrarian uh, culture in India. And this has been a prevalent thing in India post liberalization, but especially post the Modi government, where, which is who is the national, uh, who is the ruling, uh, who is the uh, prime minister now. Uh, with the BJP. So uh, like the reduction of government intervention into social welfare and a financial uh, backing for social welfare has drastically reduced. So this is like a brief setup which has already been set up by Darshana and Adrian for you. And now I will begin with a case study. Uh, and this case study is a result of an year long study. Uh, and the results you'll see are from that. Uh, firstly, I'll tell you what the movement was about. It began, in the, as Darshana said, in 2020, uh, in, like in its full-fledged mode, it began in September 2020, but it began much earlier than that in June 2020 in all the other uh, cities of India. Uh, after the current go uh, central government, which is the Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP henceforth, announced the three agrarian laws in the lower parliamentary house, uh, which is the Lok Sabha. 
while the government alleged that these were bought to reduce the hardship of the farmers, the farmers saw it as a move to privatize the sector, empowering and facilitating corporates, as we've said before, and further debilitating the farmers. According to the government, with the new farm laws, the farmers would be able to sell their produce outside the local agricultural produce market committees. Now, this is an important term. The APMCs, these are called, these are local markets uh, within the regions of the farmers where they can go and sell their goods. And the uh, uh, government claimed that they would be able to sell it outside of these APMCs and get higher claims. They further claimed that they would be able to trade outside the states and they would not require licenses for purchases. The farmers, however, did not believe these claims. They insisted that the abolition of the APMCs will force the farmers to sell the produce to corporate at lower prices. The minimum selling price, another important term here, the MSP, was assured by the APMCs. And within the new farm laws, it would no longer be assured. Furthermore, the farmers alleged that the laws would promote corporate holding of essential goods by big buyers and the lack of licensing would lead them prone to frauds. And when it comes to being able to sell beyond state lines, it is something a farm, it is already, it was already a thing that the farmers were able to do. So they did not see the point of the uh, three laws. In June, 2020, the farmers in, uh, farmers in various parts of the country took to the streets against these laws. But due to the lack of attention they received from the government authorities and the media, which could have relayed the farmers' concern to other parts of the nation, the movement shifted its organizational base to the borders of the Indian capital, Delhi. A coalition of farmers was formed. It is called the Sayyuk Kisan Mocha. And it was uh, done so that, uh, so that a wide scale protest could be mounted uh, and it, so that it could be transported to the borders of Delhi. When they reached the borders of Delhi, they were met with stiff resistance in the form of beton charging, water cannons from various state police and had to bear, bear adverse weather conditions in the open. The movement lasted for over a year. And in December, 2021, the coalition of farmer announced that their return from the borders of the capital after the government withdrew the three agreement laws. So in that sense, we can say that the protest was in fact successful. In today's presentation, I will specifically discuss how the participants of the movement use digital platforms to challenge the state legislation, media propaganda, and their own neglect. In the previous presentation, you learned about the relationship between the state, the national media within India. Not only has India fallen down on, in the ratings of the World Press Freedom Index due to the arrest of journalists who have critiqued the government, parallel to, parallel to it is the growth of the media that does not question the government, as Darshana said. In fact, many of these national media houses are now popularly termed as Godi media. The term Godi is uh, from Hindi and it means lap suggesting that these media channels are in the lap of the government. In addition to it, the current political party, the BJP, which is a right, Hindu right-wing party, it is known to have a robust digital ecosystem, which spreads its ecosystem, uh, which spreads its propaganda and aids in the, uh, the election mobilization. Can I have the next slide, please? The widespread digital web is popularly known as the BJP IT cell, and it was founded as early as 2007. Prior to 2014 election campaign of the BJP, with PM Modi as its face, they had already started testing uh, the use of ICTs for voter, uh, vote mobilization in Gujarat, uh, state elections of tw uh, 2012, where the current prime minister was the chief minister. In the early months of the movement, the national media hardly covered it. It was primarily the state media houses, especially those in Punjab that were running the news on the protests. Even after the protests coalesced at the borders of Delhi, most national television news followed the protest paradigm for reporting about the movement. The protests were thus narrated as led by a few disgruntled farmers, rioters, and separators. It was in the face of this that the farmers decided to grow their own media, as one of the participants noted. This media ranged from online and offline productions. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, Offline productions ranging from Twitter handles, blogs, YouTube channels, magazines, and newspapers. While initially many allied digital handles on the platform like Twitter and Instagram shared news from the ground, the movement started its own social media handles by the name uh, handle by the name of Kisan Ekta Mocha or KEM, which you can see in the slide, uh, which is its official mouthpiece online. It was started by young participants from the movement 
and some from the diaspora who wanted to help the movement with the aim of political engagement and counter propaganda. It had multiple roles from sharing of inf information, visibilization and mobilization. In addition to the official page, other efforts to present the narratives of the farmers also began where individuals started their own YouTube channels in the process becoming journalists. Such forms of citizen journalism were essential to fill the informational void left by the national media to provide the raw news. Urban participants of the movement noted that they preferred these to the coverage of the movement, uh, which was done by the uh, national media as it was unfiltered and it did not have the loud clatter of the newsroom debates that, was, that have now become signature of most national uh, uh, news channels in India. The precise definition of the term uh, citizen journalism, as uh, most of us know, has remained elusive. Some have called it user-generated content and others see it as content produced by non-professional journalism embedded in civic duties. The farmers' protest also become a site where such forms of journalism did not only prosper, but were essential. These were skills that were learned on the go. Participants from our research discussed that during the movement, they learned video editing softwares to create videos and social media mechanism to share these. Facebook and Instagram lives were used as forms of uh, live on the ground reporting by many such individuals. The aim of this was to showcase the wide scale uh, participation of the movement, its peaceful nature and invite others from the outside from both rural and urban areas to participate. Amidst the need to reach out to the wider public was also to improve the communication within, since it was had such a widespread movement. It was not just one border that, of Delhi. It was about six major sites around Delhi that the movement was spread into. A newspaper, can I have the next slide please, sorry. Um, a newspaper known as the Trolley Times was an endeavor towards the same. It began in December, 2020. And by the end of the protest, it had produced 22 editions of the paper. The word trolley refers to the transport vehicles of the farmers, and they have been important symbols of the protest. As when farmers from various states came to the Delhi borders, they came within these trolleys prepared for a long fight. Their vehicles were fitted in with mattresses, they had grains that would last for months, and they even had cooking stoves within them. In effect, the farmers had bought parts of their homes with them, and they had transported them to the borders. These borders were lined with them, with the entire family staying in the trolley for the entire duration of the protest. As the protest was spread over six borders of the capital, as I noted, the newspaper Trolley Times covered stories from these sites, ranging from notes on events of the day, snippets from speeches given on various stages in the various sites, and opinion pieces written by participants of the movements and even researchers who were researching on the movement. After these were printed, copies were distributed at each of the six sites of, of the protest so that the participants were aware of the ongoing events in the overall protest. These contributed to feelings of solidarity and cohesion within the movement. As even if it was, they were partially separated, the movement and its participants, they remained connected. The newspaper also helped in sharing information within the same site. As the movement uh, had spread over vast expanse with speaker concentrated only within a particular stage area within the site of the protest, those who were away from the stage or absent during the time or in, in, in uh, another area they would miss the speeches and the event. The newspaper created a transparent site where sharing of information was promoted. There was a decentralization of knowledge. It also became a collective activity where people would often read the paper together. Those who were not able to read would hear it being read out loud by others. Thus, it was not only a source of information, but also of community building. The idea here is to look at citizen journalism, not simply as engagement with the politics around the person, but as spaces of learning, of fostering solidarity and challenging hierarchies of knowledge. While much like tra traditional use, there is curation uh, even within here, but the power imbalance between the reporter and the audience does not exist. In this case, the reporters are often amongst the community and are accountable to it. And therefore the news, even though we can say is less subjective, it is much more real, it is much more authentic since there is an accountability here, which again, in the current time seems to be lacking in the uh, national news media. 
Uh, this is all for now, and I will pass over now to Adrian. Thank you so much for that, giving a little bit of background and inspiration from the Indian farmers protest movement. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about how we can translate some of the learnings from the Indian farmers protests to making digital platforms emancipatory for other social movements. So the first thing I wanna talk about is something called value sensitive design. Again, I come from a design background. So value sensitive design calls to attention the fact that all technology all platforms are made by human choices. They're an effective design and therefore everything that happens on those echo the values that the person who designed that have. And so we can use these kind of platforms for the effect of our human values. Value sensitive design focuses in on human values, which can be what is important to people in their lives with a focus on ethics and morality. Of course, a lot of social media sites don't necessarily practice value sensitive design, but that doesn't mean we can't use them for it. Work to date in value sensitive design has emphasized human well being, dignity, and justice, which is what we're hoping to do with emancipatory journalism. Again, it recognizes that technologies are the result of human choices, and that means that we can use those choices in our design choices when we are presenting these social media for our user base. So some ways that we can employ values and design within social media for social movements, we can create that collective identity that I talked about before. One way that particularly Occupy Wall Street did this really well was avoiding I statements unless somebody had been arrested. So it's creating this sort of voice from nowhere as if the entire movement is speaking together. So it would be if there's an opinion being stated, or a message being stated. There was never coming from an individual. It was always coming from the movement as a whole. It was very much we, us. Um, but of course, if somebody gets arrested, you want to use I statements so that way that person can get bail assistance, can get help from leaders in the movement. Um, they also use live stream uh, for remote participation and assembly. This is another great tool that a lot of social media has where you can allow people who may have access needs or maybe farther away from the movement to access that democratic decision making through a live stream platform. We also really want to avoid uh, the very like Western Euro American centric great man theory, where there's an idea of one person in the movement championing the whole movement and leading it and being the center of it. Not only is that very colonial and very outdated at this point, it also makes the movement weak in a lot of ways. Because then if that one person can be targeted or taken out or discredited, it discredits the whole movement. Versus if you create that voice from nowhere perspective, it's a lot harder to target an individual and discredit them. So it makes the movement stronger in general. That's why a voice from the outside to shape the collective is really key. It shows that there's a united front and it's not a bunch of individuals, we are greater than the individual parts. And when individuals are being highlighted, make sure it's because it's going to strengthen the movement. A great example of this is Trolley Times did a really good job of balancing the humanizing effect of highlighting individuals and the need to make movement seem like a voice from the ether through what they have as their martyr page. A lot of farmers uh, lost their lives during this protest or due to the inequities or um, due to depression from not being able to support their farm anymore. And so Trolley Times has a martyr page on which they report the deaths of farmers, how old they are and their names. So that way they are highlighting individuals, but in a way that supports the demands of the group as a whole, rather than worshiping or showing the strength of an individual, it's showing more of the need for why the movement exists. Also, staying on message is really, really key. So one way, again, that Trolley Times does this really well is they have a statement of intent page on their site. And it says, our intent without malice and an ulterior motive is to simply represent people's voices. In order to do so, we are reaching out to different writers and artists to seek their contributions. We are aware that partisan publishing representation can create rifts in the movement. Our team works round the clock to choose write-ups that look beyond such differences and commit to the programs of current movement that is exemplary because of the unity of farmers, laborers, and other sections. 
So again, even in that statement, we can see the we, we can see the us, it's not I, it's very universal. It also shows that they're trying to support the movement itself, not individuals, as well as tying it constantly back to the farmers movement, not saying that we're also supporting this other movement or uh, divesting into a bunch of other different issues. It's staying on message and relating consistently back to the farmers needs. Staying on message can also be creating collective lingo. We see this a lot in um, Twitter motivated social movement spaces in which there might be specific hashtags or specific language being used to unite the movement. This can be used to get around law enforcement if there are certain like trigger words that might show what the movement's next steps are or what the needs might be, but it can also just be to create again that collective identity. So if everybody's using the same language and lingo, people feel like they're a part of something and that can be really, really powerful. Also maintaining consistent communication can be really important. So if you are posting, if you're making a blog or you're posting on Facebook, make sure that it's very consistent. You might start a post off the same way every time or schedule for a consistent time every day. Um, making sure that people know what to expect and when to look for it can maintain that collective identity really well. Um, and consistent representation. So always be showing what the values of the movement are and try not to stray into like, even though it's tempting to post fun cat videos to increase uh, engagement, staying on message, keeping that representation consistent is really important. I want to highlight that there are some dangers of using social media for a social movement. One thing which the message from Trolley Times did really well pointing out is that it can be polarizing. The choice of platform can be political. Uh, we've seen this really, really clearly in the US where Twitter is now a very political space and even just using Twitter is a political statement. And so that can be really risky. If you're trying to make a popular movement, you might be alienating people based on your choices. Facebook also really has a lot of political valence attached to it now. So you want to think critically about who you're trying to reach and who you want to be a part of your movement and make that choice of platform very intentionally. People's comfort with security and publicity can also be a factor in this, as well as who owns the company, what their advertisement policy is. It's very intentional, the choices you need to make based on your platform. You don't wanna turn people away that could be an asset to your organization. Also, it's really difficult to balance transparency and privacy when using social media for a social movement. Transparency is really important because then you can get trust from people. You can also allow more people to join the movement. It talks more clearly about the movement's intentions. However, there is this balance of risking movement members' safety if you are too transparent. If you publish people's names or the next moves of the organization too publicly, then law enforcement can take advantage of that it also might incriminate people or make them unsafe by um, people who may want to harm members of the movement, even outside of law enforcement. Citizens who have malintentions towards the movement could take advantage of social media and could inflict harm on people. There's also the issue of flashpoint participation, participation and clicktivism. So this is where somebody engages for a very, very short amount of time on social media and then sort of disappears. We see a lot of flashpoint participation on social media. A great example of this would be just for the month of June, all of a sudden everybody has rainbows and everything and then it goes away immediately and there's not that support for LGBTQ plus organizations after that month. We also saw that um, after the protests in 2020 where everyone was posting black squares on their social media and then it just went away. Um, that's very indicative of flashpoint participation and it's not a long-term solution. Clicktivism is kind of hard to navigate the pros and cons of because it can reduce the barriers to activism. It can get somebody who maybe wouldn't be a part of the movement to actually engage for the first time and then maybe eventually would come to a protest or might donate. But it might also make participation seem like there's a lot of engagement when really there's not. So it's difficult to balance there. There's also the issue of the illusion of leaderless movements. This has been a really popular term recently where leaderless movements like the so-called Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street, it makes it sound like everybody just has telepathy and together as a hive mind can choose to make social change. And that's not 
real. That's not going to happen. There are leaders in the movement and there are pros and cons again to having the illusion of having it be a leaderless movement. On the one hand, it protects the movement because a leader can't really be taken out because nobody knows who that is. And if a leader gets incriminated, gets arrested, somebody else can step in because the entire hierarchy doesn't rely on that one person. But on the other hand, it also means that people don't know who to turn to necessarily when they are joining the movement. It also might create breakdowns in conversation. And it also might take away credits from people who are doing a lot of work for the movement, people who are doing a lot of labor and could really benefit from being acknowledged from their efforts and they just don't get any credit for it. You also always wanna make sure that you're trying to ensure equitable access to the technology. So making sure that you're using a site that anybody could access. You don't want to have like parallax scrolling and five different videos that have to load before somebody can access your website because what if they don't have a smartphone or they don't have consistent access to the internet? You want to make sure that you're not excluding anybody based on your choice of technology, just like you don't want to polarize anybody. You also want to make sure that people have access to what you're trying to publish. That being said, Keeping all of those things in mind, I know it's a lot to take in, uh, but we've actually prepared for our exercise for today, a demo site, as well as a pre-fluffed blog site. It's kind of like in cooking shows where you have the wet mix and then like the completed already cooked version. We've kind of prepared that for you. And so we'll pop into chat the two links and you should be able to edit both of these things. Um, and they should come up as two Google sites. Um, as we are putting this in, I do want to mention that for security reasons, um, these sites are publicly available to be edited. And so if you do choose to participate in the editing of these sites, if you do want to write things on them, keep that in mind that other people can see them. They are public and published. And so if you want to remain uh, anonymous, just don't write any personal things on it. So I will wait and see if people are able to join me in here. You should be able to click on the link and then there should be an edit button in the bottom right corner. And just write in chat if you have difficulty. You can see maybe if that second um, link works better. Great, wonderful. Okay, so I'll give you both then. And I will move to sharing my screen. Fabulous. I see a bunch of people in here. I'm going to start out for the first about 10 minutes um, showing you around Google Sites. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be creating our own citizen media platform uh, for AMC specifically. So if you want to blog about your experience, if you want to share with friends, this is where you can do it. To introduce you to Google Sites, a little bit of um, functionality. Uh, and this is completely free with all Google Suites. So if you have a Google account, you can use uh, Google Sites. Um, a lot of people don't know about it and it's a really user-friendly website builder, which I use constantly. <laughs> um, and so it can be a really great tool to have in your toolbox. So some things that you can do with Google Sites, you can add text boxes and you can change it from normal text or title, heading. You can also snap them together. 
So if you highlight under it, you can add more sections. So you can have a header and then body text. You can also embed images um, or other websites. You can create content blocks here. I'm just looking at chat to make sure. This can only be done through desktop. Unfortunately, yeah, I think that it doesn't work on mobile. I probably should, we should, probably should have specified that before, and I apologize about that. Okay. So another thing that you can do, you can add YouTube videos. Uh, you can also add calendars. So if your social movement has um, specific events happening at specific times, you can add your own personal calendars. You can also add a map. So if you're planning a protest, you can drop the map location in there. Um, we'll say, great, wonderful. We'll say that we're having a protest in Toronto, um, which there should always be a protest in Toronto. There's a lot of things to complain about. You can also insert things from your Google Drive, which I find to be really helpful. So you can insert a document. So say if you keep meeting notes during your meetings for your social movement, you can insert a doc directly from your drive and it will all show up as options. And you can choose one. If you've given a presentation at a social event, you can insert slides from Google Slides and etc. Pretty much anything that you have from your uh, Google Drive, you can insert here. Things like charts can show any results from forms that you've received. So if you have any surveys or petitions or anything like that, you can populate it with that. Um, and you can also change how it looks if you want to change the visuals of it. There's a lot of different things. I will say that there is reduced functionality for Google Sites because uh, you can't edit individual things, like you can't change the color of buttons or the font as much, you can only change it through a few things. Um, as a designer, I'm legally obligated to request that you use light or heavy <laughs> because classic is not accessible uh, as much to folks who might have difficulty reading serif fonts. Um, and heavy, depending on your social movement, might send the wrong message. It, does have a bit of a more playful theme. So if you're trying to keep a more serious bent to your social movement, staying with the more basic font styles is always a good idea. Uh, you can also create a custom one. So if you want to add a logo or a banner image, uh, you can also then custom make colors and you can custom your font. So if you don't want to use the basic ones, you can choose from a bunch of them. Again, just for accessibility reasons, try to keep high contrast for your text versus your background, uh, as well as make sure that you use a uh, sans serif font. So something like this would work really well, um, rather than something that has all the text doohickeys all over it. Are there any questions about the functionality of Google Sites? I will give, we'll say until three o'clock, for people to play around on this demo site, trying to test out the functionality that we've talked about. And then we'll come back together as a group at three o'clock to start working on the actual blog site. Sounds good? I'll also be available for any questions at this point. Ah, yes, I neglected to share about pages. So you can add pages here. So if you go to the pages tab, you can add a page and then you can create extra pages for yourself. So if everyone wants to grab a page and start editing their own page, that way you can test out some of these functions um, without interfering with other people's stuff.
I see a question about input of alt text image descriptions. Yes, it does. So I will show that now. I'll insert an image. Oh, I don't want to upload that way. All of you could see all of my pictures. So we'll go with an image from the internet instead. <laughs> it's mostly just my attempts at a professional photo um, while staying in my living room instead of a professional studio. So let's do a Google image search mountains. Insert an image. So if you go to the more editing options, you can add all the text. So mountains. That's a great question. And make sure you're always using um, the text hierarchies. So heading subheading small text because screen readers, if somebody is using a screen reader, um, that will help them navigate around the website based on what the different sections are as well. Excellent. So now I see that it's three o'clock. Uh, so um, I love all these pages. This is fantastic. Uh, so we can hop over to the pre-baked, um, fresh out of the oven, prepared for you all <laughs> website over here. And so what we're going to be using this for is to sort of test out some of the things that we've learned today. So remember, speaking from a voice from the ether, so mostly we statements instead of I statements, um, staying on message, uh, also making sure you're not practicing great man theory, and uh, championing the movement uh, and humanizing at the same time. There's a lot of things to be balancing here, but I think you all can do it. Uh, so we've created already a reporting revolution web page that talks a little bit about what citizen media is, shows some of the cities and medias in action. You can also, if you want to contact us afterwards, use our emails here on the website. But what we want to highlight here is a couple of things. On the about page, we've already posted a few community rules here. So when you're practicing uh, citizen media, you want to make sure that you stay with truthfulness. We only report what is real and we don't spread rumors when we're practicing citizen media. This is really important, especially in the age of fake news, even if it's sensational and it's gonna get in touch with the movement, we want to stick to the truth. Privacy, we don't expose individuals' identities unless they have explicitly consented. So please don't name anybody that hasn't already given you permission to do so and make sure they really are okay with you naming them. And again, we want to avoid that anyway because we want to keep that voice from the ether and not individualize people as well as respect. So there is the citizen blog page, which I will be showing you all in a minute, uh, but we wanna make sure to allow others to have a voice. So if somebody has written something, please don't interfere with that. Please don't change what they've written. Please don't delete anything. Um, keep it respectful. Everybody has a voice and we want to make sure that as citizen emancipatory journalists, we are respecting other people's voices. Um, here, we also have a bit of a glossary. So if you want to talk about something in your post that other people might not know about, you can add uh, the definitions here to the glossary. You can also see pictures of us at the bottom of the page. But now we can turn our attention to the citizen blog. So here we've already populated a bit of space for people to add uh, their own media to. So you can create a post here by creating a title and then a post beneath the title. 
and you can report on, we're going to take the Allied Media Conference as an example of a social movement. So the Allied Media Conference talks a lot about participatory action. It talks about social engagement, highlighting the community, um, equity issues. So here we want to talk about why that is so important and our own experiences as a group within the Allied Media Conference. So treat this as a blog um, about what it's been like for you to be at the Allied Media Conference, but try to employ some of the tools for citizen media that we have already talked about today. So try to use we statements, try to make sure you're protecting people's identities. Um, and if you want to add fun lingo that's AMC specific, go ahead and do that. So we'll give 10 minutes now uh, for folks to add their own blog posts. And if anybody needs help or needs me to make a space for them to put their blog post in, just put that in chat. So we'll come back together, we'll say at 3.15 and go over some of the blog posts. You can keep your camera off, turn it on, whatever you want for this section.
No worries, B. Participate in any way that you can. This is great. I think someone just joined right now. Uh, for them, we right now are uh, editing a citizen's blog that we created for you. You can see the link. I'm sending it along again. Uh, Adrian, can you send in the link so uh, they can also participate? Yeah, no problem. Oh, Darsana got it. Thanks, Darsana.
All right, excellent. We're at 315. Thank you so much for participating. This is great. Um, if folks were on their phones or maybe couldn't edit uh, in the moment, um, this website will actually will keep it up. So if people want to add blog posts throughout their AMC experience, so if there's something that really inspires you or you want to add to this blog, please go ahead and do it if you want to practice your uh, citizen media tools. Um, but for the last 15 minutes, I want to make space for any questions that you might have for any three of us. Um, so go ahead and blast away. You can put it in chat and we'll read it out or you can unmute and ask verbally. Just to give everyone else a little bit of time to think up questions, I thought uh, when you were talking about um, the value sensitive design and like more the practical tips, Adrian, I was wondering, you did mention the like the difference between serif fonts and some people not being able to read it. I wasn't aware of it at all. Um, so if there is like any accessibility toolkit or something that people might not be aware of that they can have on hand if you have resources like that, maybe that would be good Absolutely. to share. Absolutely, that, yeah. So um, for folks who may not have heard of accessibility stuff before, um, it's called WCAG, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I will post the link in chat. It is a little thick to read through because it's written as if it's a legal document, um, but it's the standards that a lot of people follow if you take a look at this and you're like, holy moly, I can't read this. It doesn't make any sense. You can just look for like WCAG explained um, and there'll be lots of resources on that. I see a question from Emily. What are other suggestions for utilizing social media without risking the spread of misinformation, conspiracy theories, hate speech, et cetera? Uh, I'll let maybe Darson not take this one. That's more of your field of expertise. Uh, <laughs> but it's like one of the hardest questions to answer um, without risking the spread of misinformation. Um, the problem is that social media, yeah, I have re some reservations about the use of social media. Uh, as we've discussed, it's a great tool for reaching a large audience. Um, but the problem with things like mis misinformation, conspiracy theories, and hate speech is that um, you as an organizer has like, you have very, very little control over uh, what another person can do and write and tweet about it. Um, but uh, um, like we discussed in the case of the website, uh, having some community guidelines within the set of people, like if you are a part of a movement, if you can communicate to people that this is the kind of messaging that you prefer, this is the ethics that you follow, then at least within the community, you can make sure that it's a, uh, you know, atmosphere of respect and um, mutual respect and cooperation rather than hate. Um, as for the other stuff, yeah, and it's extremely important to have in place something for something like a digital self-care for the movement as well, as a whole, um, where people know what to like, um, know that you can expect abuse and you can expect this sort of thing and like how you can take um, steps to protect yourself. So some of it might be legal steps, some of it might be knowing how to handle um, the affective responses as in like if you feel uh, really uh, kind of traumatized or upset by the kind of stuff that you read and you feel like you're losing control, knowing that you can talk to people, there are some things that you can do that that would be my recommendation. And like none of the answers that I've said so far um, mentions anything about like um, having control over misinformation as much as reacting to misinformation because Unfortunately, that's kind of what you can do in a sense, uh, because, yeah. Um, but the other part is always keeping an eye out for alternative media channels, which are more uh, something that you can control. So social media channels such as Facebook, Twitter, all of that is owned by giant platform companies, which are also often in collusion with the state. 
um so especially in the indian context it might be a bit risky like as i showed in my presentation like your accounts might be suspended without clear reasons and so on so it's very important to have stuff that is more um owned and like uh, so there is this whole concept of autonomous infrastructures and even thinking about hosting your website on a server that is uh, that is aligned with progressive social movements and their causes that could also be one way to go of course the con uh, there is accessibility and having someone with some kind of like technical background to take care of all of these things but um, as you build your movement and you keep um, you acquire a bit of competency uh, and like a larger community and there is some awareness about it this should be something that you keep in mind throughout like trying to um, have this idea that you would want to move from these corporate platforms towards something a bit more autonomous down the line that's uh, my answer <laughs> i hope it helps um, also i can give examples from how the farmers movement did it uh, so it was a big movement uh, and in that case uh, what's that what dashna has already said it's not controlling misinformation as much as reacting to it one way is uh, you constantly as a movement you see misinformation you the misinformation that you can see you counter it on an official page just like the kisan ekta mocha so uh, whenever there was misinformation they would find facts they would have news articles they would have research they, they would do research and they would post it on the social media page so this is the truth we found it this claim um, and the other thing is uh, having some communication between what again what dashna said making the ethics of the movement very clear so that those who want to help you are also very aware of that and can follow that so in that case in the case of the farmers movement so it wasn't just uh, kisan ekta mocha there were like a lot of allied accounts but what helped was that the members overlapped that they communicated with each other that everyone knew that this is the kisan ekta mocha is the official page and we have to follow its lead there was no ego in between the teams you know that we want more uh, trend we want to be trending more or we want more followers they knew that they were doing it for the movement so there was this coordination between different people and different teams so it, it helps to have open channels of communication between um, your allied groups and your core groups that helps as well awesome i love that. the other, the thing that i'll add from a design perspective is that um when you are putting together a site or a social media channel there are design decisions that you can make to discourage um sort of rampant misinformation um so if you make the values like really front and center um or if you uh try to make it less sensationalist like if there's a lot of flashy stuff it might encourage people to like give in to that sort of more um uh loose cannon style of reporting versus there are um tools that you can use to make things more like trust based they can be used to be like maleficent a lot of like e-commerce websites will use trust based design in order to get people to like feel like it's okay to give their like information away but when um it's a more social media site it can encourage people to keep things reined in and be less sensationalist um so i'll also post a link to like trust based design in the chat So we're waiting for questions. I thought, like in my slide, I had put more uh, resources. Oh, there is a question. Fine, then let's go to that. Uh, someone's asked, in your experience, what is the best way to encourage citizen journalism within communities, or do you feel it is best to slowly focus on organically created media? Uh, I can take the first bit of it, and then I'll uh, let Adrian and Darshna answer that. Uh, again i can speak from the case study of the farmers movement there is a way to encourage citizen journalism as well uh, because in the case of <laughs> okay uh, so uh, in the case of farmers movement uh, what they did was also uh, release even their allied accounts they released learning videos when you can uh, show individuals how to uh, learn little little things on social media like 
how to tweet, how to retweet, how to create videos. Small snippets of these videos were released. And they also invited people to come and see. And uh, people will uh, come to your movement and usually click pictures, especially in this very, very digital world. And now how you build that is by creating communities, as I said before, uh, by creating groups, by in letting people connect it to your core groups. I think that helps. Uh, rather than just letting people free ball entirely. I think it helps people to feel that they're part of the core group itself rather than make them feel that they are marginal to it. So it's good to have, again, communication channels open, create those WhatsApp groups, or if you can find safer, safer groups, if people in your country use other, like in India, there is not much use of apps like Signal, but if in your country that's available, go for these apps like Signal, uh, even more so than Telegram, I would say go for something like Signal. I uh, use uh, apps like Bridgeify, uh, use these mechanisms to create large groups and have communication free flowing in them. And that would encourage uh, citizen journalism. Oh, I, I hope that was helpful. That was just very, very, again, Darshana, if you have something or Adrian. Okay. I don't have anything major to add. I think uh, Barji covered most of it. Um, yeah, I yeah I had a thought which is kind of like slipped my mind. If it comes back to me, I will go after it. <laughs> Uh, I will say that I think this question really points out sort of the fallacy of leaderless movements uh, because people, again, are not a hive mind. Uh, so they're not just going to emerge out of the woodwork like bees and just start making citizen media. And so it does take somebody to sort of put forth the community principles. You can like call a meeting and, and put those all together and decide like who's gonna post one and all of that, but it does take a certain amount of organization. Um, so somebody needs to take initiative and start organizing that. And uh, if people are having trouble, just making sure that everybody has the supports that they might need in order to participate in citizen journalism. So maybe if there's a template that could provide scaffolding to help people like get past that sort of wariness to first post, that could be one way. Another way could be like giving like a toolkit of like, these are the kind of things that we want to write about and this is what's helpful for the movement. Any kind of like scaffolding can also help break that barrier down. Yeah. We also um, have another question. Yeah, um, uh, how can those with a professional or collegiate background in journalism unlearn slash learn for citizen journalism? Uh, 18 national. Yeah. Um, being a professional journalist in a social movement or as part of a citizen journalism movement or, uh, can be extremely valuable because you're bringing in a diverse skill set of like learning how to acquire information, all of that. But uh, I really like that you've. Um, phrase the question is unlearn slash learn because there is a considerable amount of unlearning that needs to happen, uh, especially in terms of allegiance to core journalistic values. Of course, you want to uh, report stuff that is truthful and verify information, all of that, that, that still works, but um, you need to think about the fit between some journalism values as you were taught and as you were taught to practice versus what is in the interest of the movement and the community. For instance, uh, we did discuss emancipatory journalism in the presentation, which is all about abandoning the neutral point of view because neutrality doesn't serve uh, the the movement's purpose or the way the mainstream media practices neutrality doesn't serve the movement's purpose because they've just been apathetic or uh, ign not ignorant, but they've been ignoring your cause and your, um, and, you know, like your uh, efforts to organize and to bring change. So you have to adopt a, a point of view trying to get like what you you are like your demands out there and to show why those demands are necessary and uh, yeah and for the previous question as well it's all about trying to think about what the values of the movement are as well as the aims and goals of the movement are and uh, when when it comes to encouraging citizen journalism or like encouraging citizen contributions also think about whether having a lot of people tweeting or uh, posting about your movement, is that something that your movement actually needs? Or do you want a more concentrated message or a very clear message that is communicated? What are you trying to gain from 
people's participation how do you want them to participate how do you want to so that that kind of like once you have a handle on those questions and all of these questions are quite movement specific i would say um that, that those uh, like then you can figure out how you want to proceed in terms of like should we encourage um, citizens to post a lot or um especially when it comes to repressive democracies or illiberal democracies where tweeting can also come at a cost and put people at risk so um like how to weigh the cost and risk according to that and like whether you have legal resources available to bail people out if they get arrested for tweeting all of that we don't need to go into such complicated stuff but um i would say make the values of your movement front and center whenever you're taking a decision about any of these practical decisions another thing that just helps us uh, deciding who you're accountable to because often times uh, when you're coming from a collegiate journalism background you're talking you're accountable to your audience you're not out accountability to the citizen you're you're as much as a part of uh, often when you're reporting within your uh, home country you're very much a part of that setup in which you're reporting so you are also a citizen and you're accountable to your citizens they're not just audiences they're not just spectators they are your fellow citizens and equally uh equally a citizen is a protester or an activist or a social movement uh, who's participating there i think often times uh, professional or mainstream media forgets that But the protester and the citizen become two different identities uh, while it is not it's very much the same identity so you're as much accountable to the citizen who is viewing as you're accountable to the citizen who you're reporting on so i think that's very important to uh, learn or unlearn that uh, there is an accountability here as well i have to show the truth and i have to show the truth in a way or i have to show the facts in the way that that doesn't tilt it to one or the other i would say like you know i mean we know by now that there is nothing called as being neutral like every media is neutral the moment there is an act of curation the moment there is an act of human writing uh, your objectivity goes even the in the algorithm like objectivity is far from here so if you're all writing from subjective uh, points of view and if you're all writing from our points of view it's not to bend the truth it is not to bend the truth uh, to an authority and in that line it is also important to remember the role of journalism is to all this question power i don't know if right now i mean it's been far too long since i did my graduation if it's still taught in collegiate uh, journalism courses that who are you questioning your your aim is to question the authority as a pillar of democracy as journalists so you can be a citizen journalist you can be a professional journalist you can be a state journalist you can be a global journalist you're always don't punch down like punch up awesome well it's 3 minutes yeah. past the end of our our panel Um thank you everybody for coming. Um please hit us up if you have any further questions. Um we hope this has been instructive for all of you. Um and yeah, keep editing that blog. AMC we want to see what people's experiences and perspectives on the conference are. Um and it's a good space to do a little bit of uh like self reflection um on the conference. So, yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. Find us on our social media if you want to hit us up, email us. We're all there. Thank you. I just put all the people in the waiting room. <laughs> yes, starts <Darsana. laughs> now. Hey, we did it. Let's stop the recording. Should we stop the recording? Oh yeah. Oh yeah.